My name is John Becker. For the past four decades, I've dedicated my life to protecting tactical operators. During this time, I've worked with many of the world's top law enforcement and military units. As a result, I've had the privilege of working with the amazing leaders who take teams into the world's most dangerous situations. The goal of this podcast is to share their stories in hopes of making us all better leaders, better thinkers, and better people. Welcome to The Debrief. Kelly, thanks so much for being here, man. It's great to have you with me. Absolutely. I can't wait to see what we get up to today. So why don't we start just for the the uninformed? Um, mm. Why don't we start with the quick uh, Kelly Starrett story of, of, you know, how you got into PT and and, you know, kind of started to become what you've become. Ooh, I tell you what, if we set the way back machine. Um, I have been obsessed with going fast, taking chances from a little kid. I think uh, if we frame this correctly without opening up this can of worm for everyone, I had my father was basically the great Santini. He was an F4 fighter pilot, college quarterback, but absent from my life. Alcoholic, fighting his own demons. I am one of a proud generation of lineage of Irish kids from County Cork. And I'll say that there is just a lifestyle of a generations back of bad father-son interaction. So sports for me, I think early on becomes validation. Sports becomes a way of understanding myself and, and have, I have a high genetic drive to move. So I'm always down to train, always down to compete. I love it. So that sets up sort of a lifestyle and a life where I'm raised by a single working mother. <clears throat> I grew up in Europe exposed to all kinds of crazy sports. I'm I become a kayaker. I'm riding my mountain bike and racing. I'm playing soccer like it's my job. Lo and behold, I end up becoming a professional paddler. I'm a river guide in college. I teach kayaking and, and I'm a river guide. And I end up making the U.S. canoe and kayak team with a friend. We paddle two-man canoe. And it's like with that sport where they hang the gates over the rivers, you know, and you see it in the Olympics every once in a while. And it's literally like standing in a cold shower, ripping up $20 bills. It's the worst sport. No one's there. You're never going to get famous. We got, you know, our pictures in the paper with a power bar sticker. We made 50 bucks. They would send us 50 bucks. I mean, we were just rich. So the problem with that is that uh, that, and I think a lot of people will relate to this. It was an era in the late nineties where we had embodied and embraced the models of training, which was we'll outwork everyone. That model was sort of really prevalent. Can we perform more work than everyone else? And the person who works the hardest and doesn't break tends to win. There's no conversations about nutrition. There's no conversations about range of motion. There's no conversations about sleep or down regulation or soft tissue health, or can you even access this position? Or how are you breathing? No, no one's looking at these things. We're looking at the clock. Did you go faster? Yes. No. Good. Do that again. Whatever it was, burn yourself down. So I ended up paddling myself right off the national team with a really bad cervical injury. So suddenly I couldn't turn my head. I had a flaming hot nerve root. My hand was going weak. And it's completely an artifact of twisting and rotating and having the paddle on one side of the boat 11 times a week, plus training, plus and my body finally just raised its hand after weeks of my months of my hands starting to get a little weak and tingly. And sometimes I couldn't hold the paddle. And like everyone else who went through this phase or had this happen to them, suddenly I was like, give me the prednisone, give me the cortisone, give me the needles, take out my kidney. What do I need to do to get back to my job? And my job at the time was to race whitewater. That was my job. So suddenly my job is taken away from me. And I start asking because of sort of my background and my understanding, I'm very interested in process, I've always been interested in the technical aspects of things. I start asking difficult questions. Did anyone know this would happen? Yes, this usually happens during high volumes, right before team trials, people get injured. Okay, what did we do about it? We don't have anything to do about it. We just hope we can get further next year. Hey, I looked around, every woman on the national team has had shoulder surgery. So should my daughter in the future, if she wants to make the national team, should we just have a preemptive shoulder surgery now? Should we just do that? Let's just go ahead and fuse everyone or let's go ahead and have the label thing, right? Like, is this the cost of doing business truly or is there anything that we can control 
that might mitigate some of these effects? And that's really the, gr the great question, sort of the hypothesis. So that leads me end up going to physical therapy school where I really, I wake up and I'm like, I've got to figure this out because my experience was the reactive medical system. And look, my father, my stepfather's a physician, my grandfather's a physician. Physicians are amazing. And if you have trauma or surgery, we want them. We want the really the best ones. But my experience of having pain and no one looked at how I paddled, no one assessed my range of motion, no one looked at my capacities, no one asked me about my training and nutrition. And there was my experience as an athlete was completely divorced from my experience in this medical system where I went into this, got sucked into this hallway that had nothing to do. It was like someone was speaking classical Greek over here and had nothing to do with my life, nothing the way I was training, nothing. The language was completely foreign and ultimately didn't solve the problem. What solved the problem was not doing the thing for long enough that my young body could heal itself. That Everyone can relate to that. And so here we are. I go through physio school and in my first semester of physical therapy school, because I'm already Olympic lifting, I'm already seeking very much and recognizing that there's got to be pearls here that allows me to understand complex human physiology. That's why I'm in classical physical therapy school. And I chose a heavy manual therapy school where I could put my hands on people, help them get into the shapes and positions. But we weren't talking about shapes and positions. So my first year of physio school, I discovered CrossFit. And remember, this isn't CrossFit as we know it. This is early, early CrossFit, which is you should be competent with kettlebells and dumbbells. You should understand basic barbell training. We should be running more. We should be doing basic tenets of, of strength and conditioning. And what we found, my wife and I, remember, we're multiple-time national champions, Juliet's a world champion. We found that we weren't very strong, we weren't very skilled, and we weren't very fit. We found these big, glaring holes in our operating system. And so early on, I was like, this is amazing. And it really felt like the camaraderie and training, that the suffering together felt like the team, the working out felt like the team. Meanwhile, I'm overlaying this physical therapy piece. And I'm suddenly realizing I have the greatest diagnostic tool in the world to understand your condition tendencies, to understand your holes in your system, understand your inability to achieve na native and normal physiologic ranges. So as I explained this to my mother-in-law early on, she said, you mean it makes the invisible visible? And what I realized then was that I had a perfect real-time diagnostic tool to understand the sport. And that's not what we were doing. In strength and conditioning, we were all about the physiology. Did you get stronger? Did you get fitter? Great, that's, that was our goal. But suddenly we realized we could repurpose that to understand how your range of motion was changing. And it was, and, how your capacities were changing, how having a kid or being on a red eye or wearing body armor, or playing a sport, changed your skills, your ability to access your native ranges and control in those ranges. So <clears throat> we start working on sort of, hey, how can we, you know, I'm a, now I'm graduating physio, I'm seeing people at the gym, and we start by putting out a video a day for a year back in 2010 trying to help people level up and the athletes I'm working with. And I'm starting to now be invited in places to help them untangle these complex sort of human movement phenomenon where we're seeing, and more importantly, everyone I think traditionally in the sort of 2000s was thinking injury prevention. And the sucker's bet on injury prevention is that it's impossible. But what we can do is actually play offense. You think you're working at the limits of your capacity, but you're not. You're working at the limits of your physiology currently, your range of motion, your skill. It turns out there's a whole lot more that we can uncover. We can actually have you be able to do all these things and show up for your family intact or have more movement choice or have less pain in your movement choice. And by opening up and force focusing on range of motion, do you have access to your native ranges? Can we improve, improve your biomotor output, your force production, your wattage, whatever it is you, that's important for your skill? We got injury prevention in the background because in order to do those things, we had to talk about sleep, nutrition, hydration. We had to talk about how you're moving and the way you're training. We had to talk about mindset and all of those things. And lo and behold, what we start to see is that there's this real integration between sort of who owns position and who owns pain. It's the athlete. Who owns performance? It's the athlete. And now we have a way in a safe space 
to uncover all of the problems. And so if you're wearing body armor all the time, I guarantee you your thoracic spine is going to become rigid and stiff. And you're going to do all of your moving through your lumbar spine because you're wearing body armor. And where do we solve that problem? Because when you're 19 or 20, you can do that all day long. But then suddenly when you're 30, you can't do that all day long. You know, now your back is hurting. Why is my back hurting? So the place to understand that and to see how your body's changing day to day, week to week, what your skills are, what's moving and not moving is the gym. And what we've done now is, you know, we keep, we, I created a, the IP of our book, original book, Becoming a Supple Leopard is really about creating a model of understanding complex movement behavior. And that's, you know, what it is. And what I do is take that to Olympic bobsled or rowing or, you know, war fighters or swimmers or, and I just keep trying to break the model and test the model in these different places and say, Hey, where does the model, does the model explain what I'm seeing? Does the model allow me to predict future movement behavior? And then can we communicate with it? And when we pulled out this reactive emergency of, of medicine, what we were able to do is have a real conversation about what does pain mean? When do I activate that EMS system? And what is on my sort of shoulders to manage that isn't requiring necessarily just bourbon and ibuprofen, right? There's got to be some other techniques because what we found is that not only could we get more out of the people we were working with, and we saw that because we were winning world championships and setting world records and, and people were feeling better and doing higher volumes, but also we found that we were able to extend the careers of some of the best people we were working with. And if you have all the institutional knowledge and by the time you're 40, you're actually worth a damn at your job, but your knees and back hurt and you can't be deployed or you can't do the thing, you can't knock down the door because you're worried about your neck, then you suddenly, we've lost this, the most rich, the most experienced person in the team because the model wasn't set up to support them. So that's what we've been doing. And then again, we see a lot of dirty laundry from the All Blacks, the Niners, the English national soccer team, Irish national. We, we just, I get access to a lot of people saying, hey, we're trying to go faster and have people be more resilient and come out of this thing less harmed. Can you help us do that? Yeah, and I think it's interesting because it's, it's one of the advantages I have in my day job is I have access to so many units, and so many teams yeah. that you see how people solve things. You see what works. You see what doesn't work. Yes. You, you create a laboratory of your own, <clears throat> which with, with, you know, I first became aware of your work uh, through kind of CrossFit and that, that community. Um, but th there were several things that stuck out when, when I heard you speak. That, that just felt different. It felt non-traditional medicine. You know, traditional medicine is this kind of mindset of, you know, well, you see the doctor and the doctor tells you to do this, or you see the PT and he tells you to do this. And there's a couple of things that I really love about your approach. One of them is that it is the athlete's responsibility. Like you own your own body. It, it is not, it is not, you're not going to a PT to say, here, fix me. You're going to a PT to teach me how to fix me. It is the primary weapon system. Yeah, it's fascinating though. It's it, it is a very different approach. Um, the other thing that that struck me very early on in listening to your work was this concept of access to positions, mm. and and it, it's it's a unique approach because we don't tend to think of that. We tend to think of movement no. in single plane movements, you know, bicep curls and and leg extensions, quads. And, and quads. Yeah, and, and what arm day. What struck me when I listened to you was like, you know, you were talking about being able to squat, being able to get up off the floor, being able to put your arms over your head. Where did that first click for you um, that position was ultimately what mattered? Yeah, I appreciate you identifying that as salient to this conversation. I remember sitting in my like second year of motor theory, motor learning in, in grad school, and I was presented with a a study about monkeys and how the brain was working. This might have been like my third neuro class, whatever. And what we saw was, or what the research said, is that when a monkey reached for the chip, a certain pattern of activation happened in the brain. But if you move the chip somewhere else, it was a completely different movement pattern. So the brain lit up in a different way. And it turns out your brain is wired for movement. It's not wired for muscles. 
it's wired for problem solving and learning a certain specific movement task. And once you start to understand that, then we can start to say, well, what is it about the foundations of all of these strength and conditioning pieces? Why do we do pull-ups? Why do we press overhead? Why do we do handstands? What is, what's similar about all those things? About a kettlebell snatch, about a barbell snatch. What, what's similar and different about all those fundamental shapes? And suddenly what we recognized was that we had these bookends of movement that were start position and finish position. And when I started asking people, well, do you have access to a good starting position? Because that's certainly gonna make it difficult for you to end up in a good position or an effective position or a position that gives you more choice or better access to your physiology, right? Pain, no pain aside, if your starting position is, is tweaked. If your finished position, if you can't put your arms over your head, it's gonna be very difficult. And you're gonna put your arms over your head, by the way. You're just gonna bend your elbows and internally rotate your shoulders and end up you know, in a pseudo overhead position. And what we hadn't done for athletes is we hadn't said to people, this is what you should be able to do. What we did instead was constrain the environment with movement tasks that forced us to live in those positions. And the reason, one of the reasons that CrossFit, for example, there's a lot of great training modalities. One of the reasons CrossFit was effective and kettlebells was effective and Olympic lifting has been effective is that it forces us to express normal native range of motion. You have to be able to have full internal rotation of the shoulder. You have to be able to get into a front rack on a barbell. You have to. So we have this sort of classical ballet of movement. And if we, what we found is that when we could go after and create standards for starting positions and finish positions, reference shapes for the body, then suddenly we were able to untangle very complicated movement related problems for elite Olympic lifters, elite swimmers, because the body, and hang on with a second, the shoulder, for example, doesn't do that many things. The shoulder, your arms go up over your head, it goes out in front of you, goes out to the side, and it goes behind you. That's all your shoulder does, right? There are multiple systems. You might be bending your elbow when your arm is out by your side. You might be bringing your hand down like you're drawing, you know, your, your side arm with your hand by your side, but that's still arm by your side. And so what we suddenly realized is that people who couldn't do the thing started adopting shapes that allowed them to solve the movement problem, but those shapes were just less effective. Those shapes didn't handle speed load. Those shapes didn't handle load. Those shapes didn't handle volume. Those shapes were force dumps and torque bleeds and sort of decay in position. And so when we started getting sort of more aware of the universal principles of these shapes, sort of the rules that get, ro run the road of cardinal ranges, but also the rotation required to create stability in those ranges, we suddenly realized I can go into any sport on the planet, any movement on the planet and see those root shapes expressed. And let me give you a different model for understanding what strength and conditioning really is. And hold on, I know you, a lot of people listening to this have been training their whole lives and love to train. But what I'm saying is, if we take the squat position, right? Can you squat? Can you squat with something that you're holding on to in the front, like a sandbag or a goblet? Can you squat with something on your back? Can you squat with something over your head? But that's just changing the angles of the squat. What really matters is, can you squat when it's heavy? Can you squat fast? Can you squat when and express control in this shape when you're fatigued and you have to do more than five reps, you have to do 20 reps. If we run around this block, and then I have you squat again, I'm gonna see cardiorespiratory demand start to really rear its head. Suddenly, then if you and I are competing, ooh, we start to see a little stress pressure in there, and then we're gonna to start to, so what I'm saying is, if I can't elicit errors, degradation, I can't challenge you at the limits of your capacity to maintain your shape with all of these different tools, then what I see is, hey, I'm really gonna have blind spots, because you're like, well, I squatted and yet I had this problem, I landed and my knee went in or whatever it is. What we suddenly see is if I can create a person who has movement capacity across these different domains, that's a really stable way of challenging. So if you're doing CQB, and again, I haven't gone through any of these programs, I've just watched a lot of it. Oftentimes you go through and the first thing you do is 
you're given what? No gun. We're going to go through the room. And then we give you a pistol. And then we give you a, a long gun. And, but there's no, no ammunition in it. Then, we're shoot, then the doors start moving. And then there's people in there. And what you see is that here's the fundamental skill. Can I move safely and communicate through the, through the, through the building? Then I start to add complexity. And I'm looking at your ability to maintain the integrity of the same skill by adding and challenging. And now there are open demands. And now there's uncertainty. Well, that is literally what we're trying to do in strength and conditioning. We're trying to create basic root patterns, and then we add complexity to challenge your initiate, your challenge your ability to maintain that shape. So if you come to the gym with me, I'm going to find a load, speed, time, duration, volume that's going to make you begin to wobble, to speed wobble, to load. And what I'm really doing every day is making a hypothesis and testing my hypothesis with your ability to get this amount of work done with that, by making the sort of the least amount of wobbles. Can you self-correct? And now what we've done is just layered in a ton of skill into this conversation of you being a more effective mover. We've added a layer of diagnostics to the whole thing. And now we have this closed loop where I'm saying, hey, I see you started, you could go slow and press overhead. But as soon as we added speed and some breathing hard, whoop, your technique changed. And now we can become curious about what that is. And in the context of that training session, we can minister to your positions. We can minister to your skills. We can restore your shapes. We can start to untangle some of that stuff so that next time we have a more effective learning response or more effective adaptation to the training we're doing. It's not just about, well, I obviously just need bigger muscles. That's not what it is. Well, what's interesting about that, though, is <clears throat> so crawl, walk, run is a mindset that exists in the tactical community for every skill that you learn, right? You are going to learn to hold a pistol. Then you're going to learn to point a pistol. Then you're going to learn to use a trigger. And, you know, all of that, I recently interviewed Tom Satterley, who was a 20-year you know, command sergeant major from Delta. And one of the things Tom talked about was when you get to the unit, we're going to teach you how to shoot all over again. You're going to learn yeah. how we shoot. You're going to learn our methodology. And we're going to drill that into you to the point that you have correct form no matter what you're doing, because then your shooting will not decay under pressure. This is exactly the same thing. We're going to, you know, be able to access yes. shape, be able to access Why movement. Why wouldn't it be yeah. the same thing? <clears throat> no, it is. That's what's you, everyone who's gone through, f look, my favorite thing of working with warfighters and tactical athletes is that they're the best in the world at learning new skills. Yeah. They can acquire new skills faster than anyone else. And so if you're saying, oh, you already possess this knowledge and language, and experience, then you just have to reapply it and reimagine the entire sort of training conditioning space as something different and suddenly become skill limited, which is exactly what we do when we learn a new skill or going down the fast rope or going through a hall or going to the shooting range. It's all skill limited. And when the skill starts to decay, what do we do? We keep practicing? No, we're done. You've, you've tapped out today. What's interesting about that, though, is, is in this space... <clears throat> Like even, even among units that, that that's how they trained. I mean, that's the, you know, I was trained to shoot by some of the best firearms instructors in the world and everything was very deliberate. But when I learned to work out, I learned strength, I learned whatever. It, this was not the mindset, right? It was nope. not, it was not accessing position. It was, Oh, you know, this is how you bench press, be able to, you know, be able to lift a lot of weight. And <clears throat> what struck me as you were talking about it was if my movement patterns are poor, I'm going to adapt, or I can't access my or, movement or I patterns. can't access them. Either way, I'm going to adapt my movement to accomplish what I want. But in the process, right. I'm going to yes. position my body poorly and damage my body. Hold up. Let's not say poorly. Let's say less effectively. Okay. Because if this is your only solution, I want you to use it. But I want you to have more choice, better access, more movement solutions, and you may not damage it. You miss may lose. You may suck. You may not ever achieve your best. Your tissues may be so bomb proof that there's never a pain or damage component to that. But you're right that when I use a system poorly over time, it's easy for that more easy for that system to become overworked or for me not to or my brain to become sensitized to how I'm using it. And that is a problem. Well, and realistically, if you're using the sights on your gun wrong, you're not shooting as well as you could. You've said it, and Period. that's exactly right. And so, especially since we're saying, hey, we're working with a lot of men and women who are no longer 20. 
there's patina. You know, people. <laughs> I like that. I like that word. It isn't rust. It's patina. <laughs> patina. <laughs> You've been aged. You know, and some of the world here is you cannot control for all the variables. So all of a sudden, what we see is you got pulled in through a door. You had to fight someone. You stepped through a, fell through a wall. You, you know, you suddenly see that there actually is a whole bunch of trauma and things that happen to the people that are working. But what can we control? And that suddenly means that, wow, if you can't bring your knee to your chest and your hip is missing 40 degrees or a third of its range of motion, which often happens, you're going to solve that problem somewhere up the chain. And that somewhere up the chain is your low back, your knee, your ankle. And suddenly we, what we recognize is, man, it's not just about how much weight I can bang. It's about how do I create a durable self-diagnosing closed loop movement system where a side effect of that is I become stronger A side of that? You know, I have been to some pretty amazing places and seen things where, you know, 40 year old war fighters are doing heaving snatch balances on, you know, pressure plates. And I'm like, what does that have to do with anything related to carrying a pack, stepping over a wall, you know, being able to, you know, grab the fast rope or, you know, and do that over, it has nothing to do with it. And, and I think the, the, what we saw, and I think it's, it's a feature, not a bug, is that we added a whole lot of complexity to the training domains of war fighters and tactical athletes or, or, or operators. And suddenly what we saw was, well, this feels very sophisticated and this feels very complex. And it makes me feel like I'm training, but still no conversation about position, no sense, uh, sort of benchmark conversation there, you know, and what we find is that when we just start with shape and position, then we can be agnostic that you like to train a certain way. I like to train a certain way. That's totally fine. You know, they, um, you know, I just was at a place in Quantico where they, you know, they call camp, do what you want. So once you come through, you go to the gym, and you do camp, do what you want. And the idea there is the, the men training there at camp, do what you want, can go into the gym and they're like, I like to bodybuild. I like to Olympic lift. I like, and it doesn't matter what you do, but what we're not sort of done is created a normalizing language of, hey, I see that you don't have access to your basic physiology. If you and I are having lunch and my elbow doesn't bend to come up to my face, You'd be like, what's wrong with your elbow? And I'd be like, well, nothing. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't limit me. I just use long forks, right? And suddenly, you know, you're like, dude, that's a really strange thing. I'm like, it's fine. That's your hip. That's your ankle. But the problem is you can function well enough without having to be able to bend that elbow fully. And so suddenly we end up with a complex movement-related problem like low back pain or knee pain or something's going on with the neck or the shoulder. And we don't even know where to begin to parse that out. It's always complex conversations about pain or, hey, it's always surgery. And now there are a few licks to the, to the chewy center before you have to go get a surgery. And sometimes surgery is absolutely the best option because there's been trauma. You've been blown up. Something has happened. You got shot. You need surgery. Simultaneously, man, if we can begin this conversation of self-care, of position, of restoration, of creating the most durable person best the best access to their positions given the demands of their job you'll see that you can come home and not worry about playing with your kids or you can go be deployed you know i was out at the cia and having a dinner with the senior leadership a lunch with the senior leadership and what they had started to do was to assign a dollar value to the training for every one of their operators and so in order to get people to actually give a damn about someone's shoulder someone's back they were like, oh, you know, you have, you know, trained and we've spent $1.72 million to train you. And now you are an ass that we can't be deployed. So people were like, okay, that got the sort of the people's attention. How do we bring resources and change the game so that we can keep our $1.7 million war fighting machine deployed on the front line? Yeah, no, and it's, it's a really valid point because by the time you get to an elite unit, I mean, you have spent a great deal of time. The government has spent a great deal of money. You are you are a, a professional athlete, right? You're a professional tactical athlete in the same way that and have value to the team 
and to the organization. That's right. That that you know, in the same way that that a professional baseball player has value to their organization, you know, as somebody in Cirque du Soleil has value to their organization. That's right. Um, you know, an operator has value to the team, but it's it's very easy for the organization to lose sight of that. And you know, it strikes me as you're saying this that one of the things is because we don't understand this. Frequently, we're going to engage in modalities that are probably going to amplify our problems. Right? That's if, right. If you can't bend your arm, and, and and that's because you don't have normal range of motion, well, putting on 25 pounds of bicep is probably not going to help you to rack. You're you going to look access real good range. naked. Yeah, exactly. At home when your friends are deployed. Yeah, when you can't. Yeah, while your <laughs> friends are deployed and you can't pick up your shoes anymore. Um, that's right. It, it, when did you first? You know, I know that you've worked with a lot of professional teams. You've worked with a lot of tactical units, uh, which is one of the places that we came back into 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 each other's circles. But where, when did you first start working with with law enforcement and military tactical units? I think uh, probably started to be involved in and around 2010 was sort of the first time. I think I, you know, I've been out at you know, highway patrol, working with our local, you know, Berkeley SWAT teams, um, you know, realizing that uh, these conversations, um, you know, I started to be invited in because the current system wasn't working to people's satisfaction. And I think what's salient here is we had came out of a tradition of, we'll call it fitnessing, fitness strength, not strength conditioning, but fitnessing, where we said pain is a medical problem. And that was our type one era. That was our first association. Because if I step into a room, I was just in a room full of coaches this weekend in Connecticut, really talented coaches, really superstars, and all the coaches. I said, who's pain free? Not a single hand goes up. I said, who describes themselves as injured? And two hands go up. And so there's a, I've been in rooms where I have a hundred teenage kids and I'm like, who's pain free and not a hand, single hand goes up and the parents start snapping their heads around. They're like, what, what, you know, the coach goes up to the starting pitcher and is like, what do you mean? You're not pain free. He's like, my elbow hurts every day, coach. You just never asked. So if we a tell athletes that pain is a medical problem, then we'll wait until it's so bad that I can't do my job or occupy my role in the team or occupy my role in the squad or occupy my role in the family. And that's when I'll initiate emergency help. And then all the coaches who are working with those athletes have now been disempowered and the, because pain is a medical problem. And so we all just pretend like it doesn't matter or, hey, it got better when I warmed up or we'll just work around the problem. We just won't bench today. We'll do something else, right? You're going to knock overhead, you're just going to landmine. Instead of saying, Pain is a request for change. And, and one of the things we'll do, let me be clear, everyone, is that if you've got a bone sticking out of your leg, go get help, right? If you have <laughs> night sweats, yeah, that's a medical, fever, that's a medical vomiting, problem, yeah. <laughs> yes, you've got something that smells and feels like rabies of the shoulder, <laughs> go get some help. So we all can, are so, we laugh at that, but man, you know, you sprain your ankle, you're like, oh, I sprained my ankle, it's fine, I'm just gonna be cool. But your back tweaks and you're like, holy crap, I have six herniated discs now and and I, you know, I'm going to be paralyzed. We don't even teach people how to desensitize, decongest. We don't realize that a lot of the tools that we have to help manage this, including restoring native range of motion, basic, the range of motion that every physician, physical therapist, Cairo agrees we should have, can be part of me understanding that this pain I'm having is a feature and a, re and a check engine light. And the same way, if you imagine the amount of care and feeding of your weapons, you shoot a bunch, you go clean, you break them down, you oil, and now apply that same level of care to your body and you see that they're not commensurate. People are doing no input because the body seems to work really well because it's so durable. Now we start to add in, you're a vampire, you operate at night, your nutrition isn't great because you don't have access to you know fruits and vegetables. I've been at Fort Bragg, they had to fight to keep pies out of the, you know, vending machine one day a week and they put fruit in there. And like, you know, that was a dessert and that was a big deal. I was out on the, you know, the East Coast working with uh, a team out there and they had to finally build a kitchen for all the all the kids out there and they had to fight with the Navy to not put in the deep fryer. You know, and so you'll see that people now are recognizing that hey, the burden of this has to be on me, the operator, the warfighter. And now we're, people are starting to look for those tools because 
they're recognizing that they want to come back more intact. They're seeing their brothers and sisters have these gnarly, gnarly surgeries. And what we recognize is I can't control all the variables, but I can begin to control some of the variables. Like, you know, um, we're seeing a lot less drinking happening because the drinking is interrupting the sleep. The drinking is making me less effective for the next few days afterwards. And so men and women are using drinking as a celebration, as a memorial, as a time when they're rested and on R&R, on &R, not as a coping strategy, because they're recognizing that that coping strategy was actually making these sets of variables and complexities even worse. Well, and I think a lot of times it's it's simply it's simply ignorance, right? It's it's not understanding. Nobody yeah, nobody yeah. sits down with you and goes, "Hey, when you, twenty years from now, when you retire from this unit, um, you're going to have all of these problems unless you take care of your body." In fact, we create exactly the opposite incentives. We say, "Well, Kelly, you know, if you're hurt, then you know you're going to go on light duty status, or you're you know you're going to be you're not you're not deployable." And so are you hurt? No, no, dude, I'm good. Yeah, I, you know. Yeah, I am like, good, no matter what. Kelly can't tie his shoes anymore, but Kelly's good to go. Um, and, you know, he can still bench press 300 pounds, so he's obviously very healthy. And I think it is kind of redefining the way we look at health and fitness and trying to interrupt earlier in the cycle. Because by the time guys are retiring from units and having six, seven surgeries, you know, in their, in their terminal week of, of training, they're getting, you know, six right. different surgeries to try and put their right. bodies back together. Um, it's too late. It, it, we've got to interrupt this cycle early on. And, and we've got to teach guys really, you know, this concept of, of complex movement behaviors and access to position. And, you know, everything you are doing is simply giving you the ability to go from X position to Y position quickly, strongly, effectively. And, and whether that position is a shooting position or, or a climbing position or whatever, you know, they, they, all, all of these things are, are just, you know, running is just a series of hops from foot to foot, right? Like it, it, it all does come down to these really basic positions. How, when you're, when you're working with units and teaching this, how are you teaching position? Like, is there, is there a kind of library? Did, is there a Kelly's alphabet of, of body position or how do we think about that? Yeah. Uh, my whole brain works around pattern recognition. So that's, I'm always saying like the way I've understand the world, the way I can, you know, pick up new information is how does it relate to everything else? I really need to see how these systems interrelate. And what we do is we sort of break these foundational aspects of the body around the hips and the shoulders into seven kind of key shapes that we call archetypes. They're the root shapes. And when we assess the archetype, what we're really looking at is the fullest expression of the shape. So overhead is a good example. You know, overhead is that arm is straight up and down, thumb backwards, no bend in the elbow. And I obviously can create rotation and isometric kind of force in that position. My arm is straight up. So if I'm pressing with my arms out to the side, that's still overhead. If I'm pressing a landmine pressing with my arm out in front, that's still overhead but it's not the fullest expression of what overhead is. So there are oftentimes when people have degenerative changes or have had trauma or surgeries, we might never train in those positions of fullest expression, but we will work on maintaining the available ranges. And now what we have is a way every day of saying, well, what did I, what am I training or doing today? What's one aspect of this movement system I can look at? I could, strip all the movement out of it and say, let's talk about quads. And we could do soft tissue work on the quads, right? We could get the quads to be less sensitized, to be generate more force, to have less DOMS. We could do that, but you use your quads for a lot of things. So let's figure out the shapes that your stiff quads may not allow you to have access to. So anytime we can put context to the shape, and what's cool is I have taught on every continent except Antarctica, and everyone knows what bench press is. Everyone knows what a push-up is. Everyone knows what pressing up overhead or doing a handstand or hanging from a bar is. So we have this universal language at our disposal, which is the foundational language of strength and conditioning. If we drop into any college, any national team across the planet, you'll see things that look like back squat and front squat and bench and blah, blah, blah. You'll see that. You're like, oh, there are universal 
shapes that are represented in this movement selection that everyone chooses. Why is that? Why is it that the, you know, the, the Olympic lifters bench press? Well, it turns out taking the shoulder into extension, arm elbow behind me like a run or the bottom position of a dip, it's the one position that the Olympic lifters don't do in their normal daily training. So they have to train that shape and train that position. So when we start to give people easy self-assessments that they could do every day for one position or one aspect of a position, and we tie that into the tr day's training, suddenly we can choose one aspect or one position or one movement that we train and say, hey, let's look at it. For the All Blacks, they were like, it's dorsiflexion Tuesday. So they would look at ankle function on Tuesdays. And, you know, they would ask, what is it all the things the ankle does? It points, it flexes, and, you know, and then they could say, hey, let's spend a little bit of time restoring or mobilizing or improving those positions, and then we'll get the rest of it tomorrow. And I think when we start to put position and positional restoration as part of the language of training, then everyone is looking for it. And so when we go press overhead today, Part of why I'm pressing overhead is to see how easily I can press overhead, how all of this deployment in the back of this van and wearing this body armor and wearing all this kid and nods has changed my ability to put my arms over my head. So now suddenly I have this great diagnostic tool where I can begin to understand what we call session cost. Session cost is this idea that whatever we engage in has some kind of cost on the body. It could be central nervous system readiness, it could be position, it could be stiffness, it could be just my ability to handle high volumes, whatever it is. So when we say things like recover, I'm like, you're not really recovering because we were on our feet for 22 hours yesterday. There's no way you're going to recover by what? You know, it's going to take you a few days to recover. So how do we reduce the session cost so that we can keep training volumes high? And it turns out that when we engage in a set of behaviors that allow me to focus on high level performance, keeping an eye on my range of motion minimums, my minimum competencies, you know, allow me in the safety of the gym to look at nutrition and sleep and readiness and range of motion, then suddenly it becomes a lot easier and very manageable to work on one piece of the system today and we'll work on another piece of the system tomorrow. So talk to me about those seven kind of, you know, basic positions that, that you, you mentioned, what, what are they, what, what should I be able to do? You should be able to do everything a human being should be able to do with their shoulders right? or hips. So start with that, right? And the formal expressions of that are arms overhead. We call that overhead, the overhead archetype, arm out in front, right? From reaching across my body to grab a seatbelt you know, to having control out in front, controlling someone, doing jits, grabbing someone, tackling someone from my shooting postures, you know, when I, from my draw to finding a stable position with the long gun, the pistol, those are all front positions. And, you know, we see that like, what's, what's the joke, you know, where you throw your elbow out and the, the sidearm is sideways. And, you know, that is a totally crap position where you're very unstable. You know, you can't find a very replicable position. If, you related, and what's fun about understanding these principles of movement, for example, this front rack, is that if you're reloading, the way I've seen people teach to reload, you crank that arm into full external rotation. That's a full stop. That So if I grab the pistol and fully externally rotate it, right, when it's out in front of me, it's right in my eyes, that's a fully externally rotated position with my arm out in front in a bent position. That looks like wait for it, climbing a rope. <laughs> that looks like plank. And so suddenly you're like, oh, not only do the principles of sort of movement, the movement theory of why we teach the techniques we teach overlap the physiology of the body, but also those principles attract better transference and better adaptability to the skills I want. So it's not just even, do I have access to my range of motion? Do I have access to my tissue health and my pain-free? But the, the way I teach you to grab rings and create rotation when you do a pull-up, right? Pull-uping on a ring suddenly means that you can grab something out in front and create a more stable position. You can create a more stable shooting platform. You can create better grip on the rope. You can create better grip when you're grabbing someone. And suddenly, all of the techniques that we're training isn't just about, well, this is overhead and this is overhead, but 
I now have a model of creating stable functional shapes wherever my body is because I have these principles. So we have the bot arm behind the back like a dip, and then we have arm out over the side. So we have overhead archetype, front rack archetype. We have the hang archetype with arms out to the side, either bent or straight. And then we have this press archetype, like the bottom, bottom position of a bench press. And what I'll guarantee you is if you come and see me because you're like, Kelly, I need to work up. I'm going to see you deficient in all these positions. So the question is, when and where are you going to work on these positions? And that ends up being the most salient aspect of the conversation. Where do I self-assess and where do I do this stuff in my crazy busy training schedule, my crazy busy life where I get home and I still want to be a human with my children, right? I'm not constantly just, you know, noodling on my life. Where do I do that? Well, it turns out the training environment is a really wonderful place to do that. But you need to understand that that's what you're doing, right? You need to be focusing on ensuring range of motion, ensuring the ability to reach position. And I think too often we're, we're driven to do bicep curls and not understand that if, if we're, you know, if we're elbow out and we're trying to adapt because that hurts or that's awkward because we lack range oh, of motion. Is your sidearm in front of the side of your body because you can no longer reach it on your side? That's what we're talking about. You don't have enough shoulder extension. So now you're reaching for your sidearm. Your elbow can't even come back. So your elbow flares out and you're like, I can't reach my gun there. So now you have to move it forward two inches so you have a better draw. That's what we're talking about. And if you, it, again, the example of having as much movement choice as you can. And let's just go on record as saying, now you're hypohydrated because you've been in the back of a C-130 for four hours waiting, or you know you don't want to take a pee in the cockpit or you know whatever it is. Suddenly I'm like, oh, you all you had on the flight line was a little Debbie snack cake to eat. Yeah, you better eat that, right? Suddenly we start to put in nutrition, sleep, hydration, and we have tissues that cannot tolerate less effective loads that are going to be more brittle because you're not getting enough protein or enough micronutrients or fiber. And, you know, you just went on a mission and you can't go to sleep till three or four in the morning. You're having a hard time calming down and you know, you've got to go back to work tomorrow. So where are we also talking about the behaviors that get you ready and allow you to buffer all of this training? And suddenly the training, you know, I'm, I'm legitimately asking how strong do you need to be to, you know, to, I bet you're strong enough to do your job, but when we start to really ask, are you durable enough to handle the load, the time, the domains, the, all the other stressors on top of it, what we start to see is something's going to give and your brain is going to start to throw signals trying to get you to pay attention. If you're hypohydrated, under-resourced in nutrition, stressed, poorly slept, throw an alcohol in there, let's go ahead and just identify that your brain is going to be more easily sensitized to silly bullsh where, Hey, that little back tweak, cause you broke your back or you fell on the ladder or whatever, something happened, you twisted your ankle. You're going to see that your bot, your brain is going to be a little bit more twitchy. And those things are going to start to throw error signals a lot earlier. Now that makes a lot of sense. So, so if, if Kelly's designing the, you know, strength and conditioning and, and health program for a tactical unit, what does that look like? Give me, give me, you know, you are now in charge of, you know, the FBI hostage rescue team or Delta mm. or, or LAPD SWAT or LA Sheriff SWAT or Berkeley SWAT. Um, how do you begin to build that program in, in, in Kelly's mind? The first order of magnitude is here is to say, we don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We're doing a lot of right things, right? We are, we have smart men and women leading these things. But what we can start to do is, for example, around some of the lifestyle pieces, start to establish minimums, vital signs, benchmarks. For example, you know, one of our nutrition benchmarks is that we want you to eat one gram of protein per pound body weight, and I want you to eat 800 grams of fruits and vegetables every day. Why? I'm interested in you having all of the, keeping your lean muscle, having all of the available ability to turn over your connective tissue, right? I find that when people get enough protein, they are more anabolic, they, they eat less crap, right? And what we find, honestly, is that we learn this in our high-performance environments, 
one gram is actually pretty reasonable. And what you're seeing is that you're like, well, I'm a professional athlete and you dress up like one, but then you eat like a teenager and you're not really paying attention to these things. I need you to have enough micronutrients and fiber on board so that your brain and your body can do what it needs to do to make connective tissue and joint health. And what we find is that, boy, those two limits, people aren't hitting those minimums. So now by establishing a benchmark, we all can recognize, man, I'm way below my minimum for the last three days. I got to get back, right? Oh, hey, I start making decisions about, hey, I better eat a protein and some berries for breakfast. Otherwise, I'm not going to hit my goals during the day. We start to clean up a lot of sort of poor behaviors. We start to plan ahead a little bit. We, have, we start to make different choices, availability of food for, you know, snacks on the break room. Suddenly, suddenly we're, we've all gotten on the same page of we're trying to get you to eat more fruits and vegetables, get more fiber in, and get no, and more protein in. And then if you want to be keto or carnivore or do some special thing because you're some elite person, then you can do that any way you want. You're a vegan. We can even do it that way. But we now can start applying that same level of thinking to sleep, to steps and walking during the day. We can apply it to range of motion. So we start to establish sort of some minimums. And then the training that everyone's familiar with you know, we can slow down. You know, there's this idea that we need to be the most explosive, powerful people we can. And I would argue that if you are strong and could occupy your positions well, you're probably going to be able to do your job well because you're not sprinting down and cutting and trying to, you know, you know, catch a, a football in the Super Bowl. You know, what I'm, what I'm seeing is we can start to ask, let's look at your conditioning right? Let's look at, uh, you know, your, your pathways. One of the things that we find, for example, is that everyone's talking about being explosive. But no one is sprinting anymore. So if I took a bunch of middle-aged, you know, operators to a hill and we sprinted, everyone would get injured. <laughs> we'd be pulling hamstrings. We'd be pulling Achilles. We'd be rupturing everything. So we start to ask, well, what does that sprinting look like? Look, could be look like jump roping. It could look like, hey, we're doing a salt bike max effort pieces. We're doing on the, you know, we're on the rowing machine. We can constrain, but we can start to look at energy systems. Do we do a short piece with intervals? Do we do long piece? Are we getting sprints in there? And now we can start to say, well, how many training sessions do I get a week? And where in this training cycle, which may not be a week, may need to be 10 days to two weeks long, where can we start to put in these exposures to these positions, to these shapes, to these energy pathways? And all of a sudden, it looks like strength and conditioning again, but we're just a little bit more meta around it. So we're, we're more intentional. And, and instead of kind of building based on body parts, we're now building based on energy systems and based on signaling the body, right. you know, like sprinting being a good example of, of signaling your if body. If you can do 10 strict pull-ups, getting to 12 strict pull-ups, does that make you a better at your job? No. So what, what really becomes interesting is, okay, well, what do our tests look like? So are we, you know, if I've got to run and, you know, be able to handle this load running, then I better be running regularly, right? I better be working on my skill of running, but not just going out and doing junk miles. You know, I think, you know, I've seen some of the O courses in the world. And if we just got everyone out, not on the O course, just to, to, just to test on the O course, but if we went out on the O course and we ran between sections and on skill and we worked sections. The O course is such a beautiful test because what we're really saying is under high cardiorespiratory demand, which was induced by running, I need you to have control of multiple body shapes with different sort of task demands that are gonna require you to have whole, fit, whole full hip flexion and be able to jump and land effectively. And so through the O course, the reason it's such a beautiful diagnostic tool is it allows me to see in real time what's going on. But all we need to do is sort of put some skill back into this. The other thing that's happened, and I want to be very clear about this, is that we've all fallen in love with strength and conditioning because it's really fun and you can measure progress. But if my job is to go break down doors or go clear rooms or, you know, do whatever I need to do with my job, then the training answer is, does this make me better at my job? Yes or no. And what we've found is, as we do sports specific training, which is training with teams or individuals during the season, 
The only goal of strength and conditioning in that moment is to go ahead and improve the performance of the athlete on the field. That's really simple. So I might make a whole bunch of decisions of not doing things because the only thing I care about are outputs, right? So if we're doing full formal strength and conditioning, it looks great. You're too, and you can't play soccer. You can't do your job because you're too sore. The training that you're doing is making you worse at accessing your shape because all you do is bench press. And now you can't put your heart, you can't, you know, grab your bra or tuck your pants in or put your arms over your head. What I can say is, hey, that bench pressing is not making you better at your job. So that's sports specific training. Sports preparation training, which is where we all should be, is sort of this idea, especially in this warfighter tactical group, is I'm always using the training to enhance my positions, to reinforce my skills, to find blind spots that I may not be able to see because my sport is untraditional. In this situation, your untraditional sport is your job. That way, there's, we're tied in. What's happened with strength and conditioning is that it's suddenly, if you're training like Jeff Adler or Matt Frazier or Rich Froning, you're not gonna be able to do your job. You're, a, you're not 19, and B, you can't handle that volume and still be fresh enough to do your job effectively. And we see that sort of tug and war between it's really easy to be in the gym, but it's much harder to show my competency on the range or be better teammate or work on these other skills. And one of the things that we're trying to do is say, what's the minimum effective dose in the gym now where I can leave feeling better and feeling primed and I've restored positions, she shapes and loaded myself so that my job is easier. And that's where we need to sort of be a little bit more clear in our understanding of why I go to the gym. You know, some of the best teams on the planet who are doing your job that you're talking about, they do a commando skill every day. Love that. You better shoot, blow something up, fight, do jujitsu. You got to do something every day. And I would argue that we're spending a little too much time in the gym trying to have gigantic muscles and not enough time on our skills when we could go to the gym for 20 to 30 minutes, work on a single lift, do some conditioning, get the hell out of there, right? Use it as a time of like, hey, I didn't come out beat up and fried. I came out feeling better. Yeah, but it's a, it's, it is a big shift in mindset and it's, it is a much more practical functional fitness mindset, right? It is, uh, you need to be able to do this fast. You need to be able to do this, you know, with a heavy load. And, and I think it's, we have all kind of grown up, especially if you played sports in high school, college, whatever, uh, that, you know, well, we're going to bench press. You need to get to the biggest number you can get. We're going to squat. You need to get the biggest number you can get. And, and that's easy because it's quantifiable, right? Like right. I, I can write on my, my whiteboard in my gym. Okay. Well, that, I did this and and show progress. tomorrow. I did this. And now in my, in, what I don't realize is I, I no longer jump as far. I, you know, I no longer jump as high. Like I'm not training the energy systems that I need for work, but I'm training the energy systems that, you know, look good naked or that I've been trained to do. That's right. And, and I think that, you know, one of the things that I think really is, you know, unique about your work and, and why I do think it makes sense for teams to kind of dig into it is it, it, it begs a different selection process, right? It, it, it begs a it, different it, training process. Yes. And gives us more insight into how durable someone is how they can problem solve their movement selections their like it, it what it does is it opens up a lot more understanding of why someone can't do something or why someone's having a set of skill issues or why someone's you know knees always hurt after the run you know if i could immediately drop in a couple behaviors for everyone here's let me give you two behaviors that will change your life i want you to sit on the ground at home for 30 minutes a day it means why you're watching Netflix or why you're answering emails, I just want you to sit on the ground. What you're going to find there is that, man, you're really uncomfortable because your hips are so stiff. <laughs> and what the first order of business in any of this is exposure. And so if I see you sitting on the ground, you can do 90-90, you can sit cross-legged, you can kneel, you can side saddle. One of the reasons is I need you to spend more time getting up and down off the ground. That's an important skill. But also the simple tissue exposure in those positions is going to tell your brain, Here's a position I value, and I'm starting to have exposure in these, in these positions. So when you need to fidget, fidget. But if you just start to do that, what we've just done is done 30 minutes of very intense positional, intentional work in the background. And, you know, 
I think you would find that that would go a long way. My second thing is I'm borrowing from our friend Steve Magnus, who's an incredible coach. JFW, just freaking walk. I would put in 30 to 60 minute walks in five days a week for 100% of this, uh, this group. That means on your lunch break, I want you to put a, your body armor on and I just want you to walk around the compound. I want you to get more zone two work in. You can walk fast, you can walk slow, you can carry a load, you're not. But I need you to move a lot more in this way and you're gonna have stronger feet and better, feeling better and you're gonna be sort of under the demands of that thing walking around. And if you are walking around enough between you know, day to day in your kit, great, you check that box. But now we know that you're walking. But if you are saying, hey, I'm blown, I need to do something. What does that something look like? Zone two. We're going to put big aerobic base. We're going to make sure that your energy systems are, are, are tuned up. And the fastest and easiest way to do that is walk. Then we can start layering in, smashing yourself complexity. We can do nose only. We can do breath holds during that walk. We can make it super gnarly. We can do vision drills. But all of a sudden, if you do those two things for me, you start walking a little bit more, 30 to 60 minutes every day. If you start sitting on the ground, for 30 minutes, you're going to find that you're going to start to feel better and you're going to start to decongest and handle all of this gnarly load that's sort of going on in your body in the background. It's funny, you know, I've, I've heard you talk about the, the way that kids move and the way that kids behave and the way that kids play. And you couldn't do that. It, it's, I don't even know where we're talking about this. You couldn't handle the number of falls, the sitting on the ground. You'd be broken by noon. Yeah, it's crazy because you like you don't realize as you get older you know, I always say that you get old because you lose flexibility, you lose strength, yep. you lose balance, and you lose endurance, right? That's right. And and we, those are just things we go away. You know, we don't we don't sit on the ground anymore. Like, you don't sit and play. Like, when you're a kid, you sit and play on the ground all the time. You're getting up, you're getting down, you're climbing on things. And, and in the process, you're reinforcing all of these physiological behaviors, and you're telling your body, hey, you need to hold on to you know, my ability to get on the ground. You need to hold on to my ability to sit on something and not go numb. Uh, you know, like uh, like all of this shit you need to pay attention to. And and it's funny because the older I'm getting, the more, and, and, and as I'm reading more work like yours, it really is largely signaling, right? It's telling our bodies we have to be able to do these things. That's but right. the way we live actually does the exact opposite. What you're hinting at is two important things. The key to adult learning is repetition. So how much repetition does it take to learn a new skill or to reinforce a skill or to keep a skill sharp? It takes a lot. So we all agree that. So I go to the range every day where we're always shooting, doing all these skills. So apply that to your squatting. Apply that same thinking to your running skill. Apply that same thinking to any of the training modalities. And you see is, oh, I'm not getting enough reps in. When we begin to you know, start to ask that the question about, well, how is my environment supporting my movement choices? Suddenly we realize that whether it's our fault or we inherit an environment, we suddenly realize that we're really only using a few words day to day. I sit, I walk, I sit, I walk, I sit, I walk. And that doesn't take that ankle into full range of motion. That doesn't ask my body to solve a balance problem or a movement problem. I not bringing my knees to my chest at all. And so if the body is capable of writing Shakespeare sonnets with its movement solutions, you're only using three words over and over again, sit to stand, walk, sit to stand, chair, walk. And what's going to happen is your body is going to adapt. It's going to get practice at those shapes. All right, well, this is what we're doing now. We're sitting and we're not loading. Fine. We're going to be really good at that. And then when you go stand up and need to extend your hip or put your arms over your head, you're going to see that there is indeed a session cost to this environment. So sitting on the ground was a simple way of saying, hey, let's go ahead and give us a little bit more language by exposing some of our tissues and position shapes to a little bit more diverse sets of movements. And honestly, a lot of what happens in the gym is just the formal sort of, hey, every single day we're gonna brush and floss because we're gonna touch some of these fundamental shapes. I have three things that I teach everywhere I go. I'm like, and you get to do one of these three things, firefighter, police, SWAT, tactical, doesn't matter. In the morning, I want someone to do a hip spin up. I want someone to do a shoulder spin up, or I want someone to do a 10 minute breath practice. You get to choose. And the, 
if you Google Kelly Starrett and my morning routine, you'll see my hip spin up there and my breathing practice. If you Google Kelly Starrett and shoulder spin up, those things are there. But the, the shoulder spin up and hip spin up are good examples of, hey, we may not be touching these ranges for the rest of the day, but at least let's give your brain some exposure to these shapes. We're going to squat all the way down. We're going to get into the shapes that look like lunges. We're going to kick the leg out to the side. We're going to close the ankle down. We're going to make the hamstrings under tension. And if you did that for five to 10 minutes in the morning with your cup of coffee and you did nothing else but paperwork for the rest of the day, I guarantee you, you'll be in a better position than if you hadn't done those things. So really the next sort of behavior piece here is where and when are we putting these essential aspects? If the only time I'm going to put my arm over my head is on the obstacle course or in the pull-ups, that's maybe going to give me some grief. But at least I'm thinking about, hey, I probably should hang from a bar every single day. And in this group that wears body armor a lot, you should be hanging every single day from a pull-up bar. I don't even care if your feet are off the ground, but you should spend and try to work up to three minutes of taking some big breaths, hanging. That's going to do more for your neck and back and shoulders than anything you can imagine. So just, just literally hang from a bar for three minutes a day. Just hang for a bar. And you don't even have to do three minutes straight. You can do break it up, go do a set of push-ups in between, come back and hang. Go break it up, do a set of squats in between, come back and hang. So suddenly there are, because we work, like my bobsledders look like my bobsledders. My crossfitters look like crossfitters. Runners look like runners. Rowers look like rowers. And guess what? Men and women who carry guns and wear body armor look like men and women who carry guns and wear body armor. <laughs> you could be like, I know what you do for a living. I mean, look at your shoulders. And so you could suddenly see that the domain, the sport, the environment shapes the person very much. We can get away with it for a long time, but our helicopter pilots are going up and down wearing a huge, heavy night nod system. Man, after a while, they have a hard time with that. Same thing with our fighter pilots who are, we're losing fighter pilots because their hands are going numb. So how is it that something changed? Was it that I just aged? Well, that's the slow rot idea of aging. That's no one was looking at how well they breathe. Can they turn their head? Does their back work the way their back should work? Do they, can they even create extension in their upper back? One of the things that we're trying to do, and if you go to our app, I've created a movement assessment there. Again, our app's free for a couple of weeks, but go take the movement test on the app. And you now suddenly have all the diagnostic language you need to be able to understand, do I have key access to my positions? And when we start to layer that in again, what we then have is a person who now knows what minimums are, begin to understand their patterns and can start to program and minister to that. And when we do that for months and weeks and years, we start to see a really different person emerge, a person who is more tolerant of crappy environment, crappy positions, a person who, look, if you're coming to this conversation late, then one of the things we will do in the gym is we'll just slow you down. We just do a lot of tempo work, which means we squat slower, we deadlift slower, we press slower. And by going slower, we know your tissues can probably tolerate some of those things. We'll pull out some of the speed and our people who have been injured or people who have sort of arthritis or you know, hot spots in there, we just slow down. So we'll still be loading and we'll still be training. And I'll guarantee you that if we just slow down over time, we can still have massive, massive stimulus and still you can do your job. Because what's the goal here? To be able to do your job. Well, and it's it's interesting because one of the things, that I, like I, I've, I've done long format triathlon, Ironman distance triathlon for 25 years. And the the training methodologies have changed. Like it, it originally you were always training at a seven or an eight on a scale of one to 10. And now the mindset is much more training to five and occasionally training to nine. But we haven't really seen that. I mean, you see it in CrossFit. You haven't really seen that make its way into normal strength and conditioning training for most people. Most people and have there's very little conditioning in more normal strength and conditioning. Let's just be clear about yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's strength, right? For most guys, it's, it's strength. Right. And I think it's worth talking a little bit about, you know, speed of lift and kind of mindset in lifting, because I think people fall into either a, well, the majority of people end up falling into a fast rep. You know, I, I can I can move the weight fast, got to have power kind of mindset, but that brings with it a certain injury risk. It brings with it a certain, you know, I, I try to always think in terms of what am I telling my body I want it to be able to do, right? What are you signaling to your body? Like, hey, you need to be able to 
Um, if, if you're lifting at the same speed every day and similar weights every day, then that's kind of setting that threshold. What are your thoughts as far as, is you know, a, a good mindset for, for strength and conditioning training? That we can use speed as a diagnostic tool. That if your speed, so all pain aside, all injuries aside, that we, you know, we can use speed. You should be able to do these things fast, right? That's one of the, one of our conditions of a healthy, normal joint is that it moves quickly, that we have healthy movement tissues. They move quickly. And what you're absolutely right. I should be able to do that, but let's go ahead and say that speed is the sport of skill. So if you're skilled, that skill will carry the speed. And what we see a lot of times that we just add speed, do the drill El Presidente, for example, and watch what people do, but you know, pop, pop, they just like turn around, they're shooting fast, they're not accurate. What you see is there, the first thing they added on top of poor skill was speed. And what you got was exactly what you got, sloppiness. So if we realize the way most of us are drilling, you know, you know, the kid who taught me to, the Sergeant Major who, you know, taught me to shoot from the orange squadron, man, I did very slow drills where I was like, wow, I see the truth of this. You know why I'm pressing on target, seeing my sights so slow. And if you just add speed in to your movement patterns, you're going to get exactly what we get. Speed wobbles, crap, inconsistency. What are you teaching your brain? So yes, I would say a normal joint should be able to jerk the shoulder. I should be able to jerk something overhead but we start to see suddenly that if you don't have access to your range of motion or aren't skilled as soon as i la start layering in that speed boy we're going to start to see a lot of variability in the movement and remember what i'm trying to do is say hey here's what i'm practicing and i should be using all of these tools to challenge my ability to maintain that position so I say to my daughters, for example, when we do something like floor press, right? Both my daughters do a lot of floor pressing for water polo. You know, they go down slowly so they can arrive and teach themselves to arrive in a good position and they can go up as fast as they want without flaring the elbows or doing wonky stuff. So we can use speed as saying, hey, I want you to add as much speed as you can to maintain your position. But if you don't have a reference of what good positions look like, then you're just going fast, right? And that doesn't necessarily get what, you, what I'm after. And I, again, would still say, I would rather you be able to bench 100 kilos under good control than bench 275, bouncing off your chest and flaring your elbows up. Yeah, yeah, especially because if, if you are training good form, good control, you're a hell of a lot less likely to get injured when you do go fast. If you get injured in the gym, shame on you. That is the only safe place in the world. That is the only controlled environment. You get, your, your life is not controlled when you get home to your partner. Your life is not controlled in the drive to the work. Your life is not, like the gym is the only place, okay, I have absolute control. And you're absolutely right that when we start to expose, you know, speed components in the real world, that's, that's where we see injury. We always say speed kills. And speed is the ultimate arbiter of how skilled you are. If you, your skill doesn't handle under, under speed load, then I'm like, it's an incomplete skill. But that doesn't necessarily mean I can't, should I be developing those things in the gym? Once again, are you throwing your rifle as far as you can? Is that the test? You know, that's not the test. The test is for you to be able to, to move effectively, to have movement choice and to feel good. And I would argue that we don't necessarily have to cherry pick a thousand great exercises to make Olympic javelin throwers for people who are in body armor, knocking down doors. Do you, is there in, in your mind, is there a set of, of kind of, you know, does Kelly have Kelly's tactical operator workout list that is, you know, these 20 exercises or how is you're working with a team? How are you helping them to build a yeah. system um, that, that is inclusive of all of the skills? You know, uh, I was lucky enough to go out to uh, Air Force Pararescue out in Tucson, Tucson, a uh, long time ago, and they had just got their first weights as a high performance group. You know, the Pararescue didn't have a gym; they were just sort of monkeying around. And they finally got some squat racks in. They got Rogue. They got some plates. They so 
one of the first things we want to do is say, well, let me see your environment. What tissues, what, what, have, what are your available ideas? What are your available resources? One of the things that is important is that if you don't have the resources to have a full-time strength conditioning coach, then we all need to be able to coach each other. That's an important aspect of this thing that we're going with someone and someone's giving me feedback in between sets or working on things or, Hey, I see that you, you know, and we're, we're suddenly the same way we would be coaching or teaching each other in our job. We're now coaching and teaching each other in our weight room, you know, because every human being eats three meals a day, they think they're all experts in nutrition. Isn't that weird? <laughs> and because you've been, you've been doing bicep curls at home since you were 12 does not mean that you know anything about strength and conditioning. So you know, what we need to do is go and look at the environment and say, well, what, what do you have access to? You know, what are your, what are your tools? Is it just sandbags and kettlebells? Great. Well, let's, let's make sure that we're engaging in enough exercises, you know, where we, we're challenging one or two of these patterns every day. What are these shapes? Are you in the biggest deficit I see right now in training across the board is that people do not take their hip into extension. So you don't get into lunge like shapes very often. And so what we're seeing is that your inability to bring your knee behind your butt, knees behind butt guy, what's happening is that that is making you less effective in your squat, starting to load your back, starting to load your knees. And universally in, you know, I was working with a coach named Travis Mash and he had a, a really high level, he's a high level Olympic lifter. He's an Olympic lifting Olympic coach. He had an athlete who had some knee pain. And when I said to us, hey, coach, look at her volume, look at how she's training, and look at how much time she's spending with her knee behind her butt, and it was very little. Even in her warm-ups when she would lunge, her knee would never come behind her butt. So all we did was start to program some rear foot elevated split squats, some pressing from a split stance position, just you know ideas around pushing a sled or getting that hip into loading and extension. And lo and behold, not only did her knee pain go away, but everyone's back pain went away in the gym. And so what we can start to look at is, hey, I see that you're not in this position or not doing these movements. Let's make sure we're beginning to add those things or, or be thinking about them as almost like vitamins. So even if we're squatting today, I'm a huge fan of squatting, single leg, double leg, whatever you want to squat, however you want to squat. But maybe we also need to get into some big lunge shapes and do some isometrics there. Or we need to foot, throw that foot up on the rear foot elevated split squat or Bulgarian split squat and make sure that we're actually loading that back leg a little bit just to keep that, that tissue loaded and that brain being able to access that position. And if you started to do that a little bit more, you're going to start to see that things feel better and you can go faster. So it strikes me that we talked about full range of motion in the shoulder. Let's talk about full range of motion in the hip. Um, because it, it, as you were saying, so that, we have it made me realize we hadn't. Yeah, we have three fundamental shapes. One is the pistol shape. So getting into a single leg squat where your ankle is at full flexion and your knee is to your chest. So that pistol shape, I don't care if you can get in, actually do a pistol, a single leg squat with your leg in front of you. I care that you can get into that shape because that's how you go up and down over high obstacles. You put your foot up on something or you lower yourself down off a, a, you know, a loading ramp or something high. That's a pistol shape. So suddenly we can say, well, what shapes are allowing me to be in this position? Well, something that looks like either a full range of motion ass to grass squat, or I'm doing something that looks like step ups, right? Where I'm loading that pistol or loading that shape or touching those positions. We've got a squat hinge archetype because the difference between squatting and hinging, like in a deadlift is just the degrees to which your knees are bent. So it's the same movement at the hip, but one of them has a straighter leg and one of them has a bent leg. And then we have a lunge archetype. So those three shapes sort of end up encapsulating anything that the body needs to be able to do. And that means that we're not just squatting in one position. We're narrow squatting. We're wide squatting. We swing kettlebells. We hinge. We pull. There's a lot of exposure in those positions. And again, what is it you like to do? You love kettlebells? Great. Let's swing kettlebells. You like to front squat? Great. You like to goblet squat? You, I'm a huge fan of sandbag training. Because it's so gnarly and you, it's so hard to carry this load and has such kind of durability transfer that most of my heavy squatting is done with sandbags. And, um, and I feel like that just is a, one of those ways where I can touch a lot of shapes and build a lot of sort of armor because I have to pick the thing up off the ground to squat it. Well, and in the process, you're also accessing all of the stability muscles, right? You, all all, all yeah. of those little tiny things that we don't think about 
when we're doing you know leg extension you're wired you're wired for movement you're not wired for tiny muscles yeah and it it, it hadn't until you said it it hadn't really struck on me like we we don't really care that we can bicep curl we care that we can pick something up ultimately that's the truth and i more care that when you have to grab something or something quick happens that you don't tear your biceps playing pickleball right i mean that that is a that's a real injury we're seeing we're seeing a lot of people tearing their biceps playing pickleball or you tackle someone wrong or you know i want your elbows to work like elbows that's why we still do curls but i'm caring about that your elbows can do what your elbows are supposed to do well and and realistically reactive sports are the bane of the middle-aged man right like basketball <laughs> the most dangerous sports you can yeah, do right like pick up basketball basketball and tennis, uh, pickleball pickleball yep like anything that is yep, requiring yep, yep. you to change direction rapidly volleyball um it seems to be where everybody blows an acl or you know everybody tears yeah, you Achilles. notice that top gun they're all like 19 and they're playing on sand that's what i'll yeah, say yeah exactly right? and ideally that would be a great way for us to begin to have some exposure to some of these positions that get us out of the gym, that get us interacting, get us working as a team, is playing more games. If we all just went out to the field and threw the Frisbee around, you'd be shocked at how many different positions and cutting and lateral you felt through some of the sport playing. One of the things that I try to do is saying, saying hey, the gym is a great place to compete. It's a great place to touch positions and shapes. Let's go out of the gym and go compete. Let's go be humans. Let's go play some pickup basketball. Let's go. If you don't like basketball, again, there are a thousand other ways where we can play and compete. But I think we could put in a lot more fun exposure, breathe hard, get some camaraderie, get some sunlight on our faces by going outside and 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 playing some games. Yeah, I mean, it's it's you know to to go back to what we'd previously talked about. It's it, that's how kids stay fit. Right. Kids just play. They, they play kickball and they chase each other and they play tag. And and I think we. It hadn't struck me until this conversation, but we go from multiplanar movement and kind of unpredictable lateral movement to very vertical, even in our exercise, you know, we're running yes. in a linear way. We're doing, you know, isolated muscle exercises um, we just we start to give up our ability to move sideways and to move unpredictably. Go take an eight pound medicine ball. It doesn't have to be heavier. Six to eight pound medicine ball. Take one of your best friends. Go outside and throw it back and forth for twenty minutes. You'll be dead. Throw up against the wall. I catch it. You throw up against the wall. Play games with it. I throw it over my head as fast as I can. You run to it. You throw it back. We both run to it. Like there's a thousand ways where we can be moving differently. And using and exposing and playing and getting all of these inputs in. Again, one of the mistakes in strength and conditioning, because it's so easy to codify it and quantify it, is that we've spent so much time in there when we could be doing other things. We're not the first people to say this. One of the greatest throwing coach in the whole world is a guy named Bonderchuk. And Bonderchuk would say, hey, I need you to stop benching and trying to put an extra kilo and let's go get another 300 throws in. That's the most important skill that we could do is actually go throw the thing that we're doing to get paid on. Let's go throw a different weight. Let's go through a different object. Dan John will coach Dan John, who has just been such a mensch in this field for so long with his lead athletes. They just do very simple things. It looks like front squat and back squat and strict press and push press and bench, and they heavy swings and some lunges. That's it. Then they go do their sport a lot. And I think, you know, what, you, what we forget is that we've made it so complicated and there was so many things. But if we have these basics that we run on forever and ever and ever, and then we go do our sport, we'll be much better off than what we're trying to do in the gym was build these gigantic race cars. And then, you know, doesn't get us what we want. Yeah. It's not getting us I mean, what we, we want. Are we better or worse? We've been running this experiment for 15 years now, really formally in the world. Are we, are we seeing fewer injuries? 80% of Marine Force Recon re retires on full disability. I feel like we can do better. Yeah, I know we can do better. And, and it, it just, you use the race car analogy. I mean, we're building drag cars, right? We're not, we're not building road cars. And then we're That's taking right. the drag car out and we're trying to drive it on a road course and wondering why we break it. I want it. that Toyota. I want your body to be that Toyota Hilux. Yeah. <laughs> 
that's in every austere, <laughs> that Nissan Rat Patrol, that is your body. That's the, that thing goes 100 miles an hour and you can roll it down a cliff, right? That's, <laughs> that's really what I'm interested in, in building Well, here. and especially in an environment like a tactical environment where so much of what you are doing is unpredictive, right? It's, it, is, it is reacting to somebody you're chasing. It's going over an object that, that you have not seen until you got there. It's, it's moving through small, confined spaces. Um, it's putting your arms into unusual positions, you know, fast roping and shooting. And um, it, what, what I love about this as an approach is, is really what you're building is the most robust machine you can. Because then when it gets hit with an unexpected force or an unexpected movement, which it's guaranteed to in tactical work. Guaranteed. You're not, you don't have an arm that can only do a bicep curl. You have an arm that That's can right. throw and catch and, and do all these, all these different movements. The number one way that the pararescue men were getting injured was getting the litter out of the helicopter because they couldn't get in a top down, perfect deadlift setup position. They're all squatting down the litter. Then they've got to get as organized as they can to lift that litter out. And that was the number one thing. So how do we do that? Well, we work on bottom-up setups. We teach them to get as organized as they can, picking up sandbags off the ground. And we give them more movement choice. By restoring range of motion in the hip and the ankle, lo and behold, we can get athletes, those guys, into better positions to lift that and pressurize and stabilize to lift the litter out of the helicopter. That's what we're trying to do. Well, and, and at the same time, we're building power, strength, flexibility, and agility all at the same time. We, right, it isn't. It isn't like we're going to go do a strength drill and then we're going to do a flexibility drill. Like That's right. accessing these positions, having the ability to move is enhancing all of that every time you do it. My biggest fear is tearing my Achilles. I'm 50 years old. I don't have Achilles problems, but I've just seen enough Achilles tears take down some really amazing people. So you know what I do every day? I I take a bunch of collagen and I jump rope. I push a sled. I'm obsessed with making sure that I am springy. So I jump every day. There's a jump rope. Part of my training every single day is, is hopping side to side, jumping back and forth. I push the sled so that I have to be kind of loaded and my hip is an extension where people tend to tear their Achilles. And if I rinse, wash, repeat that for the next 20 or 30 years, I think I'm going to dodge that bullet. So if you go to the gym and do a two-second warm-up, and then immediately just do three dumb mid-range exercises, you've really squandered a lot of time to uncover and to develop skills and to learn ranges and to feel better, right? To be able to put some of these basic things in as part of that hour that you may have. And a lot of us have jobs where we, training is part of our job mandate. We're given an hour and a half, we're given an hour to train every day. And if it's just a 5K run, every day. No wonder, you know, there's just, it's such a rich environment in order for us to go play. And again, did I feel better and more complete when I left the gym? That's the goal. So, so from your perspective, I mean, typical for, for a lot of guys in this industry is, you know, a, a short walking warm up, and then, you know, an hour of strength or, or they'll, they'll run. Um, if, if you were going to build that hour out, I know that there's going to be variability in it, but like, it sounds like you are an advocate of less exercises of yes. a greater range of motion. What, like, what does Kelly's hour for, for a tactical operator look like? Well, you know, again, I need to, the problem with making a statement like that is I don't know you. I don't know what your training history is. I don't know what your movement patterns are. I don't know what, what, what tools you have available, but in that hour, I'm doing some kind of really good warm up. This may be the only chance I'm getting to get my heart rate up. This may be the only chance I get to sort of touch some of these end ranges. So I'm getting hot and sweaty and, and really preparing my body. And I'm gonna choose maybe one lift. And then I'm gonna do some assistance work that looks like a little bit like bodybuilding and conditioning mashed up. And then I'm gonna ask myself, what position did I struggle with today or what hurts? And I'm gonna work on that a little bit. And I'm gonna get out of there. You know, um, suddenly when you do that, you know, we don't need three hours in the gym. I'd rather you get to the gym five or six days a week and spend 45 minutes in there or 30 minutes in there than, you know, these monster epic sessions where, you know, you're just standing around. There's a lot of time wasting in the gym. 
and that we can be, you know, doing a simple couplet and triplet, uh, you know, choose one, you know, body part, you know, I deadlift heavy once a week, you know, once every 10 days, something that's heavy in there that might be working up to something that where my speed drops or I get some triples or, you know, I'm like, oh, that was enough, you know, or I did something on the clock. You know, I think what you can suddenly see is, did you, did you press overhead? Did you touch every one of these positions that I'm talking about sort of in the basics, at least once every week to 10 days. And if we rinse, wash, repeat that, put you on basic linear progressions, add a little bit of load, challenge that with some, you know, some cardiorespiratory in between. One of my favorite things to do for old people, and I'm talking to you out there, is uh, if you're not 19, you're an old person, is that- That's a little, that's a I little like close to, to home if you-, if you... <laughs> I know, trust <laughs> me. If uh, I like to put a big aerobic piece in between my lifts. So instead of you standing around waiting for that three to five minutes to recover between your front squat sets, or your back squat sets, or your trap bar deadlift sets, let's go ahead and get on the bike. Let's get on the rowing machine. Let's get let's get some let's get some breathing in there. And one of the reasons I like that is that I like to do doubles and triples a lot, but I smash them in between some heavy conditioning. And what that does for me is that over the course of 20 minutes, I might be doing 10 doubles, right? 10 of you know, two reps of something heavy power clean, heavy deadlift, press, bench, whatever. But that uh, because I'm breathing hard on this other side, I'm getting in a lot of work. I'm also getting really hot. I get lots more repetitions under the bar, lots of little more exposure. And that breathing hard ultimately limits my total force exposure because I'm breathing a little bit hard. So don't get me wrong, this can be murderous. So we're gonna go over to this bike and I'm gonna have you push 400 watts for a minute on the bike. That's going to blow up your quads. And then we're going to go over here. I'm going to have you just hug and sandbag hug this 100-pound sandbag or 200-pound sandbag for a set of three to five. And I guarantee you're going to die. By the time we get through 20 minutes of that, you're like, okay, I'm done. Perfect. Let's go do some bodybuilding. Let's go. Let's do something vanity. Let's go touch a position, some mobility. And let's get the hell out of here. Let's go do our job. And if we do that kind of thing, you're going to feel better and, and continue to get better and better and better. We don't have to train every energy system every day. We don't have to train every body part every day. We got months and months and months to develop this stuff. Yeah, it, it, that's so counterintuitive. You know, like we've, we've been trained that like, oh, well, you know, you're going to be on the, the gym bro, you know, push and pull or, or you know, calves, yep. abs and forearms and chest and buys. And, right. and it is very counterintuitive to think, you know, you're going to do a couple of exercises and you're going to lift heavy, and you're going to do small amount. You know, you're not going to do a set of ten or twelve. You're going to do couplets or triplets. Um, I mean, it, it it is a very counterintuitive approach based on what we were taught as kids. A hundred percent, and and that's what's really fun is you know there are great programmers out there. John Wellborn, one of my favorite programmers, really respects that. Hey, we're we you know we're going to just do one or two lifts. And then a lot of, you know, couplets of conditioning where we get in a, a lot of assistance work. We get a lot of our assistance work in, in the guise of conditioning, right? And, uh, and that's what's really great is that we can be getting the tendons and ligaments full of blood. We can be feeling better. We can work on some of this vanity stuff, but we do it as assistance work to the main lift. And I think if the average person just chose one main lift a day and then did some assistance work in some conditioning together, you'd be shocked or you prioritize your conditioning because I think most people could actually get a lot better at conditioning across. And again, gamify. You're, now you're pushing the sled. Now you're on the bike. Now you're on the skier. Like, let's just get you some different exposures. You know, you give me 20 to 30 minutes of conditioning. Then we go over and hit a lift. Let's go home. You know, we'll get the rest of it tomorrow. So uh, a great follow, everyone, is Joel Jameson. If you don't follow Joel Jameson, he is just an expert in He's been working with fighters forever. He is the preeminent expert on heart rate variability. Joel Jameson is one of my favorite follows. And you'll see that if I can improve your conditioning, I can actually improve your, your work tolerance and your ability to clear lactate and, and fatigue more effectively. You know, reason I want you on the assault bike is that the range of motion is tiny. And we can go fast and we can do brutal pieces there and we can gamify it and you go, I go, and we can slam balls in between or swing a mate. It doesn't matter. What you'll see suddenly is I now I'm prioritizing the conditioning and my rest in between the conditioning is some sort of assistance work, bicep curls, pull-ups. It doesn't matter. But 
when we start to do that sort of thing, we suddenly have a, a system. If all I do is condition my legs, my arms are going to go because they're not used to sucking up lactate. They're not good at that. And what's going to happen is that my body is, my upper body is going to be pre-fatigued. So even though I'm generating all of this lactate at the, at, and, and lactic acid at the leg level, if my upper body isn't good at sucking that up, then I'm basically going to monkey with my force production, of my upper body. And this is why we love seeing upper bodies and lower bodies being conditioned together. Well, and if you think about what we are asking our tactical operators to do is frequently, you know, do some big macroscopic movement, running to a location, climbing over yep. things. And then we're at- Soldiering is in the legs. Yes, and then, but then we're asking them to do a very refined, small muscle movement, like squeezing a trigger. Um, I, we used to run a SWAT competition every year, and, and one of my great joys was to make you do something heavy, like, you know, throw a, throw a sandbag repeatedly so that you'd, you'd, you know, get nice and lactic and then have to go shoot something precise. And it was amazing how many that, people couldn't do it. Yeah, isn't that crazy? SWAT couldn't do it. They would get there, and the hands are shaking, and, uh, and guys that would shoot pretty well otherwise just didn't have the conditioning to then be able to effectively shoot. HRT, you got to run up a big flight of stairs and then do something. You know what I mean? Like, isn't that what the, what the game is? And so we suddenly, what we can say is, well, typically I need to have my heart rate high and then I have to do this very fine motor skill. And that looks a lot like biathlon in the Olympics where I'm skiing yeah. and then I have to shoot. So now I can start to ask you, why isn't there an assault bike on the range where you're breathing really, really hard and then doing some conditioning and then during your rest, you got to shoot. And we can start to expose ourselves in really safe ways to incredible learning environments. If all you do is shoot when your heart rate is down, there's no pressure and no skill, that's not, that's not what it's about. So, you know, what's fun now is that, <coughs> excuse me, we've created a lot more richness in our training and it's intellectually interesting. And you and I are competing because we're going to go peak wattage, most accuracy. And you and I can do that back and forth until our wattage drops or our accuracy drops, right? Like suddenly we can, this is, I'm looking forward to training. It's one more thing that makes this so rich and so fun. And what you'll see is direct correlation to being better at your job. Well, and you're also, you're also building team culture. You're building camaraderie. You're having fun. Uh, you know, you're, you're having social interaction. Like it is, it, from a wellness standpoint, it is light years ahead of, you know, go bang iron in the gym by yourself. Yeah. You know, one of the things that we spend a lot of time thinking about is, you know, culture of these, of these high performing teams, whether our university, NFL, um, a local team here that's pretty great this is the Niners. Um, two years ago, the owner, Jed York, brought in a full-time chef year round and the guys could stay year round and go to the park and be fed by the chef year round. And guess what? You had a bunch of 22 year old millionaires who didn't know how to eat and feed and cook themselves, but suddenly would show up at dinner, breakfast, lunch, and someone would be there and feed them whole foods. And guess what happened? Not only do we have athletes eating better, more regularly, and not just sort of eating pizza and whatever they could grab, what was easy. They also ate together. And they also found a reason to come back around. All of the high-performing teams I've ever seen eat lunch together every day. And then if they can't eat lunch together every day, they eat at least the C-suite guys and girls try to eat. I try to have them eat lunch together at least once a week. But, you know, go out to CAG and you'll see that those teams all sit together. They don't sit with another team. They sit with their team. That's what they do. We eat together and it's such an important driver. Now you can apply that same lesson to your family. You should be eating dinner at least three nights a week in spite of what's going on, the chaos, because that family is a high performing team. And what you're hitting at is now all of this richness of trust, of vulnerability, of exposure, of practice. I know what happens when it gets heinous for you. I know what your condition tendencies are. And it's not just when we're doing our job, it's because we have practiced and practiced and practiced together man, we can support each other. I start to see, hey, you're super beat up or volume. We now have much tighter sort of control mechanisms in there. And what we have is a much better culture. You're absolutely right. Well, and that culture 
you know, control mechanisms is a very good word because it we we can form our, our behavior around the culture of the organization that we're in. Right. I was using the example when I'm teaching culture. Uh, I use the example of, you know, you have you have a, a set of rules for your buddies. You have a set of rules when you're with your grandparents. You have a set of rules when you're at church. And those rules are different from one another. And the rules from your yep. buddies doesn't necessarily apply at church. Right. And and so, you know, the the behavior of the organization is driven by that culture. And if the culture is built around wellness and the culture is built around we're, we're going to play together and we're going to eat good food together and we're going to spend time this is together. What we do. Then when you start to pull off reservation, right, we start noticing, hey, Kelly's eating by himself. Kelly's not coming to lunch. You know, something's going on in his life. Um, That's right. We have those warnings much earlier. Um, it's kind of like accessing positions, right? At, at the point that you can no longer squat or you can't get off the ground, like you have a physical problem and you need to deal with the physical problem before it manifests itself by you jumping off a curb and breaking your leg. And and, and that's, you know, Correct. that that I think is is a big lesson in in what you teach is is this kind of setting tripwires around position and movement. That's right. And in now suddenly we're able to bring in nutrition and if how do we get together and celebrate is it always drinking? You know, do we go play together? How do we, you know, interact? How do we talk about you know, failure, you know, one of the things that we want to do in the gym is fail over and over and over and over again, because, and we want to be able to fail safely. I want to, I want to get to the place where I die, couldn't do the skill, fail, drop, and I want to be able to be vulnerable. I want you to be right there with me because suddenly those, those small dramas, you know, it means that when we go out and, you know, we had a, a silver squadron out once and they were assaulting a bunch of buildings in our, in the Bay area, they're all derelict from the old bases. And I went out and watched them do first pass on buildings that they had never seen before. And guess what? That was gnarly. They had crisis actors there. I jumped in as a crisis actor. I killed a bunch of friends that day because it's impossible for them to run a perfect CQB operation in a building they had never seen before. And I was like, Oh, this is the real world where basically we got to take all these Jenga pieces and put them into strange places and they don't fit. And you know, the second time you've seen the, once you've seen the house, the second time you, you know what the house looks like, it's not the same thing. So the, the idea here of really being comfortable with then the feedback, what did I learn? How does that go? We just apply the same thing you're doing with your job to your body, to your nutrition, to your health. And we just let that run for a long time. And literally things that look like we're untenable start to clean up, you know, that we have better connections. We have better, we feel safer at work. We have better inter interpersonal skills. And suddenly, you know, our job becomes this place where we go to get healthier so that we can come back to our families. But I've had all of this meta awareness training of, of, of dealing with failure of complex personal interactions of communication, of training of nutrition. And I take that back to my family and that is a revolution in how we approach all this. Which then leads to happier, healthier people, which then leads to better performance and, and better longevity. Like, it, it really is a system that, you know, you have to nurture all the parts of it in order for it to work correctly. Yeah, and that's, that's okay. In my worldview, the strength conditioning coach is at the center of the wheel because no one actually has more contact with the person than the strength conditioning coach. I know your movement history, I know what you're working on, I know what your injuries are, I know what your family looks like, and I can turn up the dials or turn down the dials. Hey, frying pan's not hot today. Let's just make sure you're moving through full range, you're t feeling better. Oh, you're, you're cooking today, we're gonna, we're gonna load it up and let's go heavy, right? Like I can suddenly say, hey, your knee's starting to hurt a little bit, great, let's see if we can work on it here. Oh, we weren't able to solve it, let's kick it up the chain. That, for me, that person is the center of the the whole cog because we are the only people who can truly understand what's going on with that person, with their readiness, with their range of motion, with their nutrition. It gives me a perfect sort of center point to be able to touch so many different things and then bring in experts if I need that expert, if I need that help. And then what we suddenly have is we have a, a diagnostic model where 
if the any of the strength and conditioning coaches you're working with should be able to tell you exactly what your problems are, where you're going, you know, should that person be on the on the team or not? That's how powerful this environment is. It gives us a chance to really understand ourselves, understand fueling, rest, recovery, all the things that we know that make durable people. The strength and conditioning place is that, and we haven't fully sort of realized that potential there. So if, if I'm a team leader, I'm a team guy, like w- talk to me about resources. Where can I go to get smart? You know, obviously, Supple Leopard, good place to start. The original, you know, the original story. Yeah, book, I, I but- would even right now, you know, one of the things that we did was our last book is Built to Move. And I would say, look at Built to Move because there are some pieces in there. It's not exercise, but there are some pieces in there that make the foundation for all the behaviors that we use to support athletic movement. We'll call that, right? Or, or people have to use their bodies for a living from nutrition and sleep and decongestion and those things. And, and that would be a, a great resource for you as a, as a simple place to saying, hey, look, there's a lot of this unskilled care, unskilled behavior that we could start to put in. Like I gave you an example of upping your protein and eating more fruits and vegetables, right? Those, those are two examples from the book that really transform lifestyles and make a lot more durable people. Um, you know, what you suddenly also start to realize is, well, you know, who, who is programming or understanding our needs or based on what needs you may have to go out and get some help. And people like John Wellborn is out there. Um, you know, people, uh, there, are, there are probably really good, smart and strength conditioning coaches. You know, you, you're going to have to bring resources back to the unit. That's one of the things you're going to have to do. And use this as a live experiment of, hey, I, I've started to toy with this and this really made a big difference. We believe in the sanctity of this model called test, retest, share. If someone, we have this decentralized approach where suddenly you're like, dude, I didn't drink for a month and my sleeping got better. I'm like, oh, let me try that. That's really interesting. You know, hey, I started, you know, tracking my sleep with an aura ring and this is what I noticed, you know, like, hey, maybe I'll get an aura ring or, you know, uh, hey, why are, you, why are you drinking that right now after training? Well, I don't know if I'm going to be able to eat again and I want to make sure I got this window covered, right? So suddenly we have smart men and women who are out there working towards the same thing and they're trying to bring resources to the group. And I think that is the way we decentralize this. Which again goes back to culture. It goes back to creating a Everyone is working to solve and improve the environment. And, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, 3M had that famous thing where everyone was responsible for two innovations a week or something like that, right? And if everyone solved that issue, and that's, that's how good teams work. Teams are like, here's what I own. Here's how I can get better. Hey, have you tried this? And suddenly, man, I'm telling you, this is the, the old model of just like, we're going to do as much as we can and suffer in silence versus, wow, this is the place, you know, we... I have worked in a group where the paramilitary organization had only had a red team or a red team and a green team. They didn't even have someone, you were either on duty or you're off recovering to go back on duty. There weren't enough people to have a red, yellow and team. They couldn't even try to get four groups. You know, there weren't enough people there. So if someone goes down on that organization, whoo, there's a real impact. Berkeley swap. They would, someone would get injured the whole budget would go out the window for the whole year because, you know, someone goes out on disability and suddenly they can't hire another police officer. Everyone's doing overtime. You see suddenly that it's a competitive advantage to be thinking differently about, Hey, we're here. How are we going to feel better and use this time at work to actually put ourselves into better positions to do our job and to be better family members? Well, especially in an environment where right now most teams worldwide are at about 70% strength. So if they're rated for 60, they've got wow. 42 to 45. I didn't yeah, know that. It that's, is, uh, it's, that's bananas. Yeah, and, and it's not uncommon in a tactical unit right now that if they're rated for 60, they have 10 guys on long-term IOD. I have seen and believe strongly that we're going to have more demands on these groups in the future than less demands on the groups in the future. So we need to be thinking about how do we get more people in the pipeline? Yes. But how do we retain the people in the pipeline? And that I think is a real opportunity for us to be doing. Well, and it is a lot easier to take somebody who's already trained and retain them than it is to bring somebody in and train them. Whew. Yes, it is. 
you know, I, I want the person I've been working with for 10 years, but if your knee, you know, like just because, you know, you're always inflamed and you don't have range of motion and you're stiff, there's just a lot of things that we can do to actually support you. And again, theoretically your job, this is just a job. I just want, I understand it's a calling and people love this, but your goal is to show up again for your family and to come out of this as unharmed as you can. And there's a lot of overpressure and helicopters and crazy things that happen and you may not be able to come out unharmed. So how do we minimize that and build as much durability as we can? You know, one of my you know friends was in four helicopter crashes. He's like, after the fourth helicopter crash, the military thought that was enough. And I was like, enough. Like, isn't one helicopter crash enough? He was in four helicopter crashes, you know? And uh, so, you know, at some point you recognize realistically, I'm like, hey, bad things happen. That That's going to be the case. So where do we not only build in durability, but then also come back and say, hey, how do we put you back together in this context? We have those resources and abilities. Yeah, Kelly, I, I so appreciate you taking the time to do this, man. I will uh, we'll link in the show notes to everything that we talked about as far as uh, additional resources and obviously link back to you. Uh, is there anything we've forgotten? Any any uh, Anything you guys are working on that you want to share or, or talk about that people may not be aware of? You know, um, one of the things that I would encourage you to do is if you go to builttomove.com, we have a 21 day sort of on ramp for our built to move challenge. And I'm not saying this to you. I'm saying this. I want you to bring your family along on your health adventure. And that I want you to be the node of health in your community. And that means your family. That means your kids. That means your aunties and uncles. You know, that means your brothers and sisters who don't live and train and think they think you're a mutant and you are, but there's a real opportunity for us to say, hey, here's what I've learned at work. And I'm going to transform my community through it. We have always believed that the highest calling of sport is to transform and transmute those lessons of high performance into our families, into our households. And I want you to do the same thing. And I want you to bring everyone along on your wellness, fitness, performance journey. And the easiest way to start to see the change is like, well, most of us are actually not with our teams 24 seven. We're with our families the rest of the time. So how can I turn and start to pivot some of these things in and use the lessons I'm learning at work to have healthier kids? I can't think of a better place to stop than that, Kelly. Thank you so much, man. My pleasure. Great to see you, my friend. <laughs>